We preview the Charlotte Hornets offseason contracts, decisions on personnel, all that stuff. And Brandon Miller, he finally gets some love. We'll get to it all today, Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube. There's Doug Brands, and you can find his Substack on everyhornetsboxscore.com. And I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on the radio, Sports Radio 92.7 WFNZ, every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. We've got some national columns to get through here today and they're actually at least one of them says something pretty nice about the charlotte hornets it doesn't it doesn't disparage brandon miller Finally. and the rookie of the year voting process it, it actually gives him love and says he should be three but we'll get to that just a little bit later on in the show today but let's go through the offseason preview pick up a conversation we had in the first segment yesterday doug and more so with miles bridges clearly being the biggest decision this team has to make but there are a couple of other contracts that you have to decide if you want to pick up some non-guaranteed deals so we'll get through that as well bobby marks on espn he gave you the whole spiel about every single team what they need to do this offseason that had already been eliminated from postseason play unfortunately the hornets here are here as well and so they he has stuff like free agents state of the roster off-season finances top front office priority extension candidate to watch team needs and draft assets top front office priority that's where miles comes into play here mm-hmm. doug and he goes through some of the numbers we did last or last segment or yesterday in the last episode bridges average career high 21 points he was in the 46th percentile at his position in effective field goal percentage, 40th percentile in two-point percentage, but he also had career highs in usage rate, rebounds, and steals. So we don't know what kind of money he's going to get, but there are seven teams with projected cap space, including Detroit, who he's been linked to before, and Utah. If there is no interest from teams with cap space, And the Hornets' intention is not to sign bridges, not to sign bridges. Both sides could explore sign-and-trade options, end quote here from this article. I don't think that's likely, Doug. I think you and I, we've been operating as if he's going to come back. Like Steve Clifford, if he has anything to say about it, Miles Bridges is going to come back. And the free agent pool isn't as good. I know you have that list in front of you as well. I I don't see a world, really, you know, not a realistic one to where he leaves, but – Maybe there is that chance. I don't know. What are the chances you think he goes? Well, I think the the chances that other teams wouldn't be interested, I think, would be pretty low because when you do look at the free agent pool, especially at the power forward position, it's it's pretty thin this season. I mean, it's Pascal Siakam, it's Tobias yeah. Harris, it's Miles Bridges, and really, I mean, it drops off pretty significantly after that because you you would then go to look at Obi Toppin. Uh, Slow mo, Kyle Anderson. Can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine if Slow mo came to Charlotte? Uh, what what would Eric Collins do? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> he he would hate it. He would veto it if he had broadcaster veto. He would use it on Slow mo. Oh yeah. So I don't know. Um, but it, it is thin, and so the Hornets have a decision to make, really. And that decision comes down to: Do you retain Miles Bridges? Hope he improve. Hope that he improves his efficiency offensively with the understanding that there really aren't a ton of better options to be had out there, or do you not, and do you bask in $40 million roughly in cap space? Because that's what the Hornets are looking at for the first time. Walker, we're here. We're finally here. The Hornets do have some cap space, you know, and $40 million would be like the maximum if they got rid of Bertans and they removed all of their cap holds. Uh, But they could retain a lot of their young talent and still have – a massive amount of cap space to deal with. The problem is, okay, you got all this cap space, but can you really use it to improve your team? And I, and I think that's the big question for the Hornets and why it would make bringing Miles Bridges back a little bit more attractive because the pool is so thin, especially Walker for a team that I think you and I both agree need to get bigger, stronger, tougher, uh, better defensively. And if you lose Bridges – I mean, you know, take away all the stuff with the mid-range shots and the offensive frustration. Take away all that. If you lose Bridges, 
you're not getting better in any of those things that you actually need to improve on. You're getting worse. Yeah, I mean, I guess you, I guess you could defensively. I, I, I defensively, even he admitted at the podium he needs to be more consistent because he falls asleep at the wheel quite a bit. But like, I, I wonder if you spend that money on defensive specialists or somebody that's an all-around player. But you're right. Like, there's not a lot of players that are as good as Miles Bridges in on the free agency market. And so, if you wanted to try to bring back the best players as much as possible then Miles would be a part of that. You mentioned the cap space Bobby Marks has here that Charlotte has $105 million in guaranteed salary, mm -hmm. well below the $141 million salary cap. Mm -hmm. The future of Bridges and the decision on whether to waive Bertans will dictate how much flexibility that they have. But you're also talking about non-guaranteed deals like Seth Curry, $4 million, Bryce McGowan's $2 million, Poku, $2.3 they have non-guaranteed contracts, and Curry's contract does become guaranteed on June 28th. And so we'll see what happens with Seth, who helped, but maybe you want to spend that money elsewhere. Yeah, there are a couple of deals. Curry's one of them. There's another one that comes up in July. The weird thing about Breton's deal is that it's an early termination that I don't think they have to make a decision on that until January. But yeah. it even though they don't have to make a decision on whether they actually have to pay that money until then, it counts – towards their cap number, I imagine that that big $17 million sits on their cap. So unless they make that decision in the summer, you know, I don't, they wouldn't be able to use that cap space to go out and make a move. So, yeah, I mean, they've, they've got some decisions to make whether or not, I, I think, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel like it's almost a guarantee that they're going to pick up Trey Mann's option. You know, I mean, it, that doesn't seem like to be even a decision, right? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, you know, Trey Mann was good enough this year to warrant that. And you're talking about his team option coming in at what is it? Four point, million. Yeah, four yeah, point three, nine. Yeah. Nothing. Four point nine for the next season is your team option. So, um, you know, it's still a, a good contract, like fi or a fine contract for Trey Mann. I don't know how much he's going to play. And uh, Trey Mann does seem like one of those guys, though, Doug, that if a new coach comes in and values something differently, that could be a guy that got a lot of playing time for one regime and then doesn't nearly as much when everybody gets healthy. And then so if you if you have the entire roster getting healthy next year and you also have a coach that values. I know that's a joke, but if you have a coach that also values different things, go on, you also have a coach that values different things. Like, Trey Mann could be a candidate to just not be a part of the rotation anymore. And, you know, maybe it's not a foregone conclusion, but I, I'm with you. I, I would pick it up and and not think too much about it. And then we'll see about Michich as well. Yeah, like you got a bunch of little decisions that go a long way because they all add up, you know. So um well, yeah, well Michich, I guess it's seven point seven million. He's got two more years left on his deal. So, you know, Michich, like if you have him, then do you want Michich and Trey Man or are you just rolling with Michich and not going with man? I guess that's the question they would answer if they think it's that hard. Well yeah, and forty million dollars sounds like a lot, but when you take into account, okay, if you sign bridges for, I don't know, 20, 22, whatever that number ends up being, um, then that's half of it or nearly half of it is going to be taken up by that, okay? Then if you get a top four pick, that's at least $10 million a year. So that's half of that. Uh, you know, the cap room runs out very quickly, mm -hmm. though I think the Hornets are going to be in a rare position after getting rid of Terry Rozier and getting rid and that cap number and getting rid of and, and Gordon Hayward would have come off the books either way, but that number being gone now they are in a position I think where it's going to come down to roster spots and rotation priorities rather than money and or, or unless and I don't think this is going to happen yet, but unless the you know front office and the and the ownership group decide, all right, we're going to go all in. We're going to go after Pascal. We're going to do whatever we got to do to maybe even go over the cap and into, you know, the, the apron territory or tax territory. Uh, I don't see the ownership gro group doing that yet, but um, you know that's that's always sitting there too. Do they go all in? All right, let, let's let's finish up some of these before we move on to draft assets. It, Cody Martin and JT Thor; those are the guys that you're talking about that are extension eligible. It's unlikely either player gets either one of those extensions. In fact, JT Thor has the option. I, it, JT Thor is not on this team next year, right? Do you think so? No, because again, I think that's where what I was just saying that it, this is going to come down to roster spots and rotations, yeah. and I I think this is a good opportunity for the Hornets to really look at each player and go, 
okay, what do we know? Do we know enough? And if we know enough and it hasn't been good enough, then it's time to just go try someone else. Like, let's you know, go out there. If Philadelphia flames out in the first round, go out there and get, you know, Melton. You know, just try. And, and two, I think there's an option to look at a player and go, can we prioritize something else at this at this position or this player? And unfortunately for Thor, the, the shooting did come on there at the very end, but it hasn't been consistent enough. Uh, defensively, you know, looks a little lost at times. Uh, and and is not big. Unfortunately, didn't get big enough, strong enough to really be an impact player uh, down low. And so, yeah, I just think unfortunately the more Thor movement is coming to an end. All right. Speaking of JT Thor, you know, getting drafted with that second round pick they acquired in the Mason Plumley deal, I believe they were also able to get JT Thor in that. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Let's talk more about the draft and what the Hornets could do in this upcoming selection process. What are the needs, the skill sets that the Hornets would like to have on this roster? We'll get to it in just a moment here on Locked on Hornets. This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard not looking so good. You're feeling low, not sure you or the team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up and say to yourself, Time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heist, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right, the smash hit mobile game, Monopoly Go, lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone, anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards, to compare your progress to your buddies, and there's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. You can charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there. Put on your game face and download Monopoly Go. And now it is free on the App Store or Google Play. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Doug, let's go back to this article and go to a different section of it. The draft assets, the draft and team needs for the Hornets. Let's start with the needs there because Bobby says besides health, catch and shoot threats on the perimeter is what you would need with this team. The Hornets ranked 21st in three-point percentage this season, and Charlotte will also get a boost with a healthy Mark Williams. I hope that doesn't become a joke, but hopefully he's healthy. Opponents ranked second in rebounding percentage and shot 66% on shots less than five feet from the basket against the Hornets. Charlotte also finished 22nd in points in the paint scored. Do you like Bobby's assessment of this team? Uh, Yeah, I mean, you need to replace players like Bryce McGowan's and JT Thor, who whenever the ball found them in the corner, you you as a fan were watching going, ah, like that's play ruined. you got to find other shooting threats that that are going to receive those passes from LaMelo Ball or Brandon Miller or whoever. So, yes, I mean, I think that's a priority – I think, again, bigger, stronger defensive assets are still going to be prioritized. I mean, I think that's why a lot of people like Stephon Castle in this draft. Uh, you know, do, But if they get the number one, number two pick, uh, would that be a reach? I don't know. You know, But you, you've got to find some players that can contribute immediately on the defensive end. And that's why in the last segment I mentioned Melton, too. I mean, I think there are options out there in free agency that aren't like the top, top, top options but could come in and be, you know, three and D type specialist. We it feels like we've been on repeat. We've been saying this for years, but it continues to be an issue. The injuries only continue to expose. Well, what the injuries do, Walker, is they expose the fact that the players that you were hoping were going to become those threats don't look like they're going to become those threats. The second round picks, unfortunately, haven't paid off. And look, they're second round picks, but they were high second round picks. You know, and and when Bryce McGowan's and JT Thor were taken at the time, you and I were looking at those players as sort of like, ooh, th- this was an opportunity for the Hornets to trade up into the top of the second round, take a player that they thought what projected them in the first round, and so you were expecting them to contribute, and unfortunately, they just haven't lived up to that to this point. So you got to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I'm really interested to see what Nick Smith Jr. can do with an offseason of work and getting back next season. How much is there? Because you, I, when you discuss kicking it to the corner, when a play yeah. goes to, you know, it runs through its progressions and then the ball finds itself in the corner and it's JT or it's Bryce McGowan shooting it, you're right. I don't feel good about that. That's not a possession that I want to happen. If Nick Smith Jr. is in the corner and he ends up, he ends up with an open corner three, 
then I'm game. Like, yeah. let's see if you can let that thing fly and, and see if it falls in. You got to be better inside the three point arc offensively. You got to be better outright defensively. But you're so young, and like this is one of those second round projects that feels like it's going to be worth it, Doug. And I'm excited to see if this can finally materialize into anything because we got it from Devontae. And maybe there's a little bit of Devontae Graham in Nick Smith Jr.'s game to where he becomes an NBA player and he's valued and he hangs on rosters a while. Uh, somebody you can call on. Is it Devontae or is it Bryce McGowan's, whose career isn't written yet, but certainly a disappointing second season in the NBA? Steve Clifford said he was surprised about Bryce's game at the end of his rookie year. Like, he was going to give Bryce a shot, and it just didn't materialize after a bad summer league. Remember, that was certainly underwhelming. And then, you know, this year didn't really give us a whole lot, despite some real opportunity to run. So is it going to be Bryce, or is it going to be Devontae? Anywhere in between, that's what I'm, I'm I'm hoping for the positive with Nick Smith Jr. Oh, yeah, for sure. And while he technically wasn't a second rounder for a first round, yeah, 27th first pick, rounder, but... he, he would have been a second rounder, I think, had the Hornets not uh, jumped up there and taken that opportunity. I, I, I think he was a danger, at least, to slip into the second round. And so, you know, the big question for Nick Smith Jr., and I said this in my solo episode earlier this week, is big summer for him. What does he add? defensively, the effort is there, right, Walker? I mean, he is he's a little jumping bean out there. He's, he's all over the place. There's no question he wants to be a good defender. But, you know, when you put Nick Smith Jr. out on the floor, you're, you're, you're downsizing a little bit at the shooting guard position because he's not a good enough passer to play him, to play him at the one. You've got to play him at the two. And so, but does he does he add some more playmaking skills, or does he add some bulk? Uh, does he add uh, even better defensive like awareness, so that it's like okay, he's not only he makes up. This is where uh, Davis Bertans uh, allows himself to remain on the floor, where he makes up for the fact that one on one he's not really a great defender, but he's a really good team defender. Does Nick Smith Jr. up his game there? Uh, you know, we'll have to see. Um, that's going to be the big evaluation pieces for me is what does he add when we see him in summer league next season? Uh, that's that's what I want to see because, look, shot making wise, it's all there. Shot decision, uh, you know, but if he's but if everybody's healthy, I worry less about shot decisions for him. Uh, you know, than, than, yeah. if they, than if he was like a primary option, which I don't think he'll be. But shot making, it's all there. Yeah, and and you look at the draft and just look at the players available. You know, I, I hate to do it. I hate to feed into the joke of, oh, of course the Hornets are at play for getting the number one overall pick in the weakest draft we've seen since 2013. I hate to feed into it. They didn't want to be help. here. They didn't. It wasn't. It, 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 they it would be a joke if the Hornets, if their like long term plans were to get them to this point and get the yeah. number one pick. That's not what happened here. They have literally tripped, fell, broken their ankle into two straight drafts where they're at the top. They, they have, it's so funny. That is, that is so funny to me, Walker. They didn't want to be here in either of these seasons, and and yet they get the number two pick. They could jump Detroit and Washington and Portland, yeah. all three teams who definitely wanted to be here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They definitely wanted to. And, and De uh, Detroit a little bit. Like, I'm sure they didn't want to be here in this way, like with, you know, flirting with the Bobcats record for a while. But you're right. You know, point's still proven. I, I can't help. You know, you look at, uh, I don't know, some of the players here, especially the foreign ones, but Zachary Rizaker, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, but he shoots well. Uh, the the shooting is a little bit further down when when you want to take some of the shooting there like Dillingham is the fourth pick in this latest ESPN mock draft but mm -hmm. it feels like you're sacrificing defense Reed, Reed Shepherd. Shepherd is yeah, yeah Reed Shepard. so Reed Shepherd Stefan Castle who's not a good shooter but a great defender Dalton Connect they're all going to be at least in that seven nine range and then I I guess they could finish up wherever but if, if like that's where I want to be. I want to be in that. I feel much more comfortable picking there than I do at the beginning. And part of it is because I don't have enough knowledge on the foreign guys. And so that's on me. But a lot of it, too, is, of course, with everybody talking about how weak this draft is, it, it doesn't come with the stakes of picking number one. But also you just have some, OK, I, I can see those guys working in a specific role. And, you know, maybe this is trade back. Like, I don't I don't know. I don't it, know. It, it's well, not NFL. I, I think it's trade back. And this is going to sound strange, Walker, but I want you to hang with me here. I think it's trade back if the Hornets get the number one overall selection. Because, yeah, I, no, because I think in a weak draft, 
the number one overall pick still holds some cachet. Like having the number one overall pick, having the the pick of this you know particular litter that doesn't appear to be great, it still holds some weight. And I think you could actually trade back from one. But if they get the fourth pick, then I think they look if they like somebody who is projected at seven nine, then you there's no to me there's no pressure at that point to reach. Yeah. Because what are you reaching for? Nobody knows what the hell is going on. And th- like you know really even one one through fourteen, everybody's just like question mark question mark question mark. So you just take whoever you want if you're a four. But if you're at one, I think you'd have the opportunity then to trade back even to four, five, six, let somebody go get their guy who they've fallen in love with, and you get to pick up maybe a player that could actually, a veteran player that can actually help you, or continue to do the Oklahoma City thing and acquire more assets that you can add to the Miami pick, that you can add to the Dallas pick, that will, if you can't make a move this offseason for you know, a, a big time player that you would give up three or four first round picks for. Well, look, <laughs> there's a free agency period in 2025 and 2026. So keep collecting those assets and and then wait to strike and make your move. No, love that. Love that idea. All right. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Continuing the draft theme. We got a good one last year in the NBA draft. Brandon Miller. The question is, some other people didn't really believe he was a top three rookie this season. Not the case with Zach Lowe. We'll get to some of the reasons why Zach Lowe has Brandon Miller as the third best rookie in just a moment. Before we talk more about Brandon Miller, I want to tell you this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Make your first bet an automatic win. That's FanDuel, America's number one sports book. More Lockdown Hornets ahead. Walker, how did you feel last night watching NBA playoff action and uh, just seeing a number of former Hornets on the floor? Caleb Martin for the Heat. Yeah. You had uh, for Philly. You had both. A really old name in Nick Batum, but also, of course, Kelly Oubre hitting a, a huge bucket at the rim to, to help get Philly past Miami. Yes, my girlfriend was watching with me last night, and she said, wait, is that is that Tsunami Poppy? I said, yes. Yes, it is. He's playing in the postseason. And I said, also, there's Kayla Martin out there. Terry Rozier isn't out there because he's hurt, but he is playing with the Miami Heat, who does, oh, of course, get to the postseason. And then she said, well, you know, yeah, tough. It's tough to be a Hornet, but at least if you sign up or with the Hornets or if they draft you or whatever, at least you know you're destined for greatness after the fact. At least you just have to take your lumps and then you go to the postseason afterwards. I was like, yeah, that's kind of the requirement for a lot of these players that do play with the Charlotte team. How, do, so, how does yeah, it make you feel? How does it make you time. answer the question? How does it you, you talk? You're bragging about having a girlfriend. Answer the question. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm bragging. Uh, she likes it. You no, know, Tsunami Poppy stole her. Um, no, it's fine. I've made, I've made peace with this. Like, I, this is this is totally fine. I got to see Nick Batum do some stuff in the playoffs with the Clippers and become a valuable asset for teams after we overpaid for him. I, you know, I've seen Malik Monk leave this team and thrive in a six man role. Maybe he wins six man of the year this year and, you know, have great efficiency with the Lakers. Like I've, I've seen this before, Doug, I've seen it too many times. I, I can only blame myself if I'm hurt now, you know, like I'm, I'm desensitized to this stuff. So yeah. Uh, how did it make you feel? It seems like you got some issues to work out watching those guys out, out on the court. Uh, no, I've come to terms with it because, and, and yeah. here's what I would say to anyone that's disturbed by it. This is, this is the way of things. This is w- when you, when you run an organization and you don't continue to improve each and every season and you don't use all of the tools available to you to actually go out there and spend the money to actually go out there and put winning, uh, winning teams together then your role players who will eventually find other teams are going to look better elsewhere because none of these players have become 
like stars in the league, even Malik Monk, sixth man of the year. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from him. He's played tremendously well in Sacramento, but he's not an NBA star. It's not as if they're letting players float through their system. It's not a Christian McCaffrey kind of situation. It's they're doing the thing that they should have done for Charlotte had Charlotte stayed healthy enough and improved enough to put a quality product out there where they, as a role player, could shine. I mean, that's the whole thing. Kelly Oubre, to me, doesn't look like any different player with Philly. He's just getting an opportunity to make big plays and big moments, and there's a lot of attention going to other players on that Philly team. <laughs> you know, Joel Embiid. That are, I mean, Joel Embiid, the attention that he drew on that play where, where he found Kelly Oubre, first of all, big guy making that kind of pass, drawing the attention yeah. away, that opened that whole play up. Charlotte does not have that kind of talent, and, and so that's – you know, that's the way of things. I feel I feel bad for Terry Rozier, although I, I wonder, like, okay, Jimmy Butler looks like maybe he won't play, maybe he won't play for the rest of the playoffs. Like, I feel bad for Terry in the sense that he goes there for a playoff opportunity that might not even materialize. But if he's healthy enough to play in this next game, it's going to be the Terry show. If it's no Jimmy, he's going to get an opportunity in a play-in game yeah. where he didn't perform very well in, in either of the Hornets play-in opportunities – He's going to get an opportunity here to to keep his yeah. team alive. No, that that that's a good point with Terry. I, I hope it happens for him because I, I want to see Miami in the playoffs. Like I want to see playoff Jimmy go at it. I want to see an upset, the the eight over the one seed. Even though that's not going to happen this year, although it's Boston, your boy Jalen Brown, Jalen Clown, as you like to call him. So you know maybe that happens again, but I don't think yeah. it will. Especially not with Miami. If if Miami's out, then yeah. That's not going to be very interesting. I'll say if you're a Hornets fan and you're looking for something to watch in the playoffs, I would be cheering for two things. One, I would be cheering for a first-round exit for the Philadelphia 76ers, and I would cheer for a a surprise first-round. It's not probably going to happen in the first round because they're the top seed, but an earlier playoff exit for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Because the OKC uh, Thunder have a lot of team options that are coming up. The Hornets have already taken like four of their players. So they've got a bunch of team options coming up. Uh, Joe's one of them. Uh, Wiggins is the other one. And I think they have a couple more too. They've got a lot of decisions to make too. And Philadelphia has a lot of players that are sort of in that weird, either restricted or unrestricted free agent zone. If both of those teams flame out, I think that they're both due for a – uh, possible, you know, reorganization or rethinking. If, if you're Oklahoma City, you want to get more veteran. If you're Philadelphia, you might just want to rethink the whole thing and go back to the process. But that's going to open up opportunities for the Hornets to get in there in free agency with a little bit of cap space to make some decisions. So that's what I would be cheering for. And, and by the way, if you care about draft implications, when you have Miami's pick and Miami loses, maybe they miss the playoffs altogether. That's going to be something good for the Hornets because that thing goes unprotected. If it goes to our, it goes to little, it's actually unprotected, right? I think it's Miami lottery protected first. And then if Miami gets that pick, then it moves to unprotected. And also the Dallas pick that's just top two protected. And if Dallas loses against the Clippers in the first round, which is certainly possible, that series is going to be crazy to watch. And then you just are really hoping Luka gets angry and leaves and gives you a lottery pick for the Hornets. That's what you want. Um, Real quickly, I I did want to give Brandon Miller some love via Zach Lowe because Zach Lowe talked about the rookie of the year results. And it's pretty simple to him, just like it was to us, Doug. This is all we were asking for was appropriate recognition Wimby is first, Chet Holmgren is second, and there's Brandon Miller. Zach Lowe has Brandon Miller as the third best rookie this season. He said Miller passed Holmgren in scoring over the last 20-plus games, but Holmgren is ahead everywhere else. His two-way work on an elite team is enough for him to coast into number two. Then he said once Jaime Jaquez Jr.'s minutes and production dropped, he's down to 32% on threes. There was no major competition for Brandon Miller at number three. The advanced numbers don't love Miller but they don't love any rookie who played real minutes in a consistent rotation role. He said, Amen Thompson and Brandon Pajemski have solid numbers, but what Miller managed as the sometimes number one option on a terrible team, it trumps everyone. Pajemski has veteran talent all around him, and his shooting numbers are almost identical to Brandon Miller's. Miller scored 17 points on even decent efficiency, 50% on twos, 37 on threes. He's a borderline miracle, given the injuries and overall talent dearth in Charlotte. Miller looks like a future two-way star. Glowing review from Zach Lowe on Brandon Miller. 
I, he's exactly right. Look, if you if you just bury your head in the numbers, then yeah, you can make an argument that he was the fifth best rookie or whatever. If you just look at the numbers, if you actually watch the games and you actually watch his progression from game one to game 82, what you saw was a player that is going to be very difficult, if not impossible, if he continues this, you know, uh, continues this improvement, which has been very quick improvement. He's going to be very difficult or impossible to figure out. And they're really only three players, maybe, uh, well, I would say Wimby is definitely, like he's not, there. nobody's going to figure that guy out. He's going to be a problem for the league for however long he stays healthy. Uh, but I would say there are three other players that to me qualify as players that have the potential to be difficult or impossible to figure out. And that's Brandon Miller, Amin Thompson, and Scoot Henderson. Uh, and Scoot did improve at the end of the year, and and I I think you know he he silenced uh, some of the doubters at least uh, towards the end of that season for Portland. But those are the three players. So so get out of here, Brand. Uh, look, Brandon Pajemski has the potential to be a good rotation player, but you can figure him out. Jaime Hawkins, they already figured him out, and that's the danger when you're a rookie and you play a lot of minutes and you are look you're you're going to figure some things out as as opposing NBA defenses if that player isn't good enough. Um, and Brandon Miller, I think, showed that really the only thing holding him back is is Brand like Brandon. Brandon, there's certain things that he's got to improve in terms of his body that, you know, he comes on your show willing to admit, hey, I've got to put on muscle, I've got to get stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but but no they they were throwing double teams at him constantly towards the end of that season because they could and he was able to beat some of those. And so I you know, yeah, I'm totally in agreement with Zach Lowe here. A total potential two way star ability for Brandon Miller. He got a different kind of attention than the other guys did, and it's no question. It's no question. Very different attention. And the and, last and, thing I'll say on that. And, go ahead. Well, so, but he didn't fall apart, right? That's the thing. Hame didn't get that. Brandon didn't get that. Brandon Pajemski didn't get that. Miller got that attention, and we could be sitting here talking about, well, you know, Brandon Miller, he looked good, and then defenses adjusted, and he completely fell apart and wasn't an offensive factor at all. That that could have been a reality, and then you and I would have been like, oh, boy, I don't know about this. You know, I don't know about this Brandon Miller guy. That's not what happened. He was a little bit inefficient, sure, but he was not able to be figured out that easily on defense. Yeah, the the thing about the numbers, too, saying that maybe that's the reason why you would go with Hakez and Pajemski, or maybe not even Hakez, but Pajemski and whoever. I mean, the numbers you could also say work in Brandon Miller's favor compared to those guys. If you look at different ones, that, that's the thing about it. I, I like advanced numbers. We reference them all the time. I think it helps us understand the game, and maybe it runs contra- contrary to what the eye test tells us. I We reference them all the time. But we could also go to the numbers that tell us Brandon Miller is a better rookie than those two. So, yeah, like that. Anyways, it felt easy for me. Go ahead. You have one other thing you want to finish up on? He had to score a lot and he had to shoot a lot. And so we keep saying advanced numbers. But if you look at stuff like, uh, you know, PER or game score or any of these numbers that try to like put – everything together in a pool and give you one number to, to tell a player's impact. Those numbers were for Brandon Miller were hurt by the, by the fact that he really had to focus a lot on scoring and, and look, he's got to improve his playmaking. Miles Bridges said that in the season, like his evaluation of Brandon Miller got to improve his passing. He's got to get bigger. Yeah. I think when he gets bigger, he's going to be more of an impact player on the boards and he, but he showed that ability. There were eight, nine, 10 rebound games for Brandon Miller. They just weren't consistent. The only thing that was consistent for Brandon Miller was scoring. And I honestly, I think that was by design because he was really their number one scoring threat for so much of this season. And so that's where the context comes in. That's where I think that some of these folks that were hating on Brandon Miller, they were failing to really evaluate him based on the situation, and they were just looking at some of these numbers. All right, that'll do it for Locked On Hornets. Thanks for making us your first listen. As always, we're free and available anywhere you get your pods, including YouTube. Check out Doug Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com, and listen to me on the radio, Sports Radio 92.7 WFNZ, every weekday from 12 to 3 on Wes and Walker. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Bye-bye. 